Well, good morning, everybody. Um, again, my name is Whitley. I am a genetic counselor at Hudson Alpha. I've been working here just under six years. So next month, I'll celebrate my sixth anniversary, which um, seems a little bit crazy. Um, but I was really excited to uh, be asked to speak to you all today. I'm extremely passionate about um, making sure students know about genetic counseling as a career option, uh, basically because of my own path to um, how I ended up in this career. I had uh, started out in chemical engineering as an undergraduate because I liked math and science in high school. And the, the message to me was, well, if you like math and science, you need to go into engineering, get to Auburn. Um, still liked math and science, but realized engineering wasn't really for me. So I changed my major to molecular biology. I had never seriously considered any traditional pre-health path, like a pre-med, pre-pharmacy, pre-dental or anything like that. So I just assumed, well, I guess, you know, if you like molecular biology and you're not going to be um, some one of those types of healthcare professionals, you become a scientist, which obviously is, is awesome too. But I really wanted an opportunity to work with the public. So I struggled with that for a couple of years and um, sort of by chance found out about genetic counseling at sort of the 11th hour. And it ended up being a perfect fit for me. And um, I was fortunate to be able to get my ducks in a row uh, quite rapidly to be able to apply and, and get in. So that being said, uh, I would have saved myself a lot of stress had I known about this career as an earlier undergraduate student or maybe even as a high school student. And um, so I'm always looking for opportunities to talk about what genetic counseling is, why it's exciting to me. And uh, of course, just give you a little bit of information about the nuts and bolts if it's something that sounds exciting to you as well. So for today's talk, I'm kind of just gonna give an, a broad overview about genetic counseling, talk a little bit about the type of work that we do at Hudson Alpha and share a case example, but throughout the presentation, I'm going to be kind of bringing up some issues that genetic counseling bumps up against that's not just rooted in the cut and dry um, molecular genetics of things and uh, get you hopefully to see why this is a great blend of, of several different um, several different interests. So uh, the first question might be, what is genetic counseling? There may be people um, on this meeting or at this meeting that are not familiar with this, have never heard the term before, or maybe have heard of it and are not, um, not sure exactly what it means. So as it turns out, our professional society a number of years ago um, came up with a nice definition for it. And it includes the phrase, the process of helping people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological, and familial implications of genetic contributions to disease. Now, obviously that's a mouthful. Um, if I am meeting new people out somewhere in a social setting and they ask me what I do and I tell them I'm a genetic counselor, I don't really respond with this because I don't make a lot of friends that way. What I usually say is that um, it is a career where we are helping patients and families who have or are at risk to have a genetic disease. And, and helping is very broad there. You know, that, that help can come in a lot of different forms. Sometimes it's helping them um, understand their, their own um, risk factors and, and sort of what's happening on this test result and what that means for them. Sometimes it's helping them understand what it means for their families, helping them adapt to it, helping them seek appropriate care based on this information. So there's a lot that that can encompass, um, but I think that, that that gets to what the NSGC was trying to say there, right? But it's a little bit easier um, to talk about conversationally. So some of the topics that are very typical to a genetic counseling encounter um, with a patient include things like medical history. So obviously if I've got a patient sitting in front of me and we're trying to figure out if they might have a genetic disease or maybe at risk to have a genetic disease, I want a detailed uh, summary of kind of what their experience has been so far. Do they have symptoms that are concerning? What specialists have they seen? Um, what types of testing have they had, whether it's genetic or other types of tests? or evaluations by different um, providers. As um, you might expect, we spend a lot of time talking about family history as well. So, you know, it's not um, necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio of things that are genetic and things that are inherited, and we'll kind of touch on that later. Um, but a number, of, um, a number of conditions are things that are actually inherited and tracked through the family in an appreciable way once you are collecting appropriate family history. And so something that we are quite specifically trained in is um, gathering accurate, detailed family history information and being sure that we're asking the right questions to, to make that a worthwhile tool. 
education is a huge part of what we do, um, whether it's educating families on testing options, patients or families on what their testing options are. Sometimes it's even a matter of educating them on what the condition may be that they are being tested for or being considered for. So for example, you could have individuals that present to genetic counseling on a referral from a provider and they're there to actually receive follow-up testing on a condition that they may not even be particularly familiar with. Sometimes this happens, for example, in the uh, prenatal setting, which is a, a, a major area where genetic counselors are employed. Um, if a woman that is pregnant has a um, abnormal screening result at her OBGYN office, that's indicative of an increased risk for a particular um, disorder and then gets referred to genetics, she and her family may have never heard of that condition. So there's, I mean, there's even that education piece, like as soon as they walk in the door to say, here's why you're here and here's what we're going to be talking about. And then of course, there's all the downstream education, the testing options. And then once test results are back, you know, how do we make sense of genetic information, whether that's inheritance patterns or what even is a gene or what is a, what does it mean to say that we have a base pair change in this gene? All of those pieces kind of go into the types of information that we end up being responsible for explaining to, um, to these families. And then as the name of the profession would imply, counseling is, um, is a part of our work, but it's important to not confuse this with careers in mental health counseling or, um, or licensed therapy work, we're not mental health care providers. We are primarily, um, you know, I usually kind of characterize my job as probably 70 to 80% genetics. And then the remaining 20 to 30% is sort of this um, psychosocial approach to addressing more, um, more emotional concerns helping patients with adaptation skills when they learn particularly distressing information, facilitating decision-making and those sorts of pieces. So it's not, um, I, you know, if there is need for more involved um, therapy type work, that's not something that they would continue to see us for. It really would be something that they would then be referred out to a proper therapist to kind of continue that work in more depth. But we do have um, specific training in some of those areas that I mentioned, as well as um, just good interview and communication skills that are important for, you know, really making sure that you're understanding um, and listening to the patient. And that's a, that's a huge piece of our job. And it helps inform all of those other topics that, that we go into with them. So we're um, a little bit all over the place as far as where genetic counselors can be found. Um, hospitals, obviously, clinics, laboratories. Um, so there's a very, uh, very quickly growing sector of the genetic counseling profession where we are actually employed in either academic or commercial testing labs um, to do a variety of things. So sometimes it's kind of on the R&D side of things and actually helping develop new tests. Um, sometimes it is more involved in report writing. It could be customer service. Um, this sort of overlaps with industry a little bit if you're getting specifically into those commercial laboratories, but oftentimes we um, can be seen in roles where we are working as, sometimes they're called something like a medical science liaison or some other pieces where they actually do some outreach to healthcare providers to educate on newly available genetic tests and identify patients that would be appropriate for such tests and then also help support those providers when results are returned in kind of helping, um, helping them determine next steps and um, explain that information. And then as I kind of alluded to a moment ago, there's a number of specialties that genetic counselors work in within the medical field. So um, prenatal and preconception, pediatrics and oncology were kind of historically the big three, um, but that is growing quite quickly. I put cardiology and neurology on here. These are, these are also um, huge areas for genetic counselors because of rapidly advancing um, genetic knowledge in, in the way that uh, genetic variation contributes to disease in those areas. But some that I left off here, ophthalmology is a, is a huge one. Um, hematology is another, is another popular area. Um, so really, you know, anywhere that um, where genetics can have an influence on a person's healthcare, 
genetic counselors um, can play a role. So again, this is not a not not a comprehensive list either way. Um, and there's uh, there are always kind of new um, tasks that are being added to our plate, which uh, which I really enjoy because it keeps the job um, itself interesting and the career interesting. So one thing that um, genetic counselors do have specific training and experience in um, is the idea of ethical, legal, and social issues. So um, assuming I think all of you are, are either faculty or students sort of in the sciences, you've probably heard of this term before, thinking about ELSI issues as it relates to maybe new technologies being available um, or, you know, it comes up with, you know, as we talk about things like CRISPR and, you know, some of these like bright, shiny things that are in the news a lot. Um, but these issues also come up in sort of everyday um, genetic testing care. And um, a couple of terms that I'm going to throw out there and we'll kind of come back to these include patient autonomy. So this is a cornerstone, a cornerstone of the genetic counseling profession. And this is just the idea that a patient should be able to make their own healthcare decisions um, about genetic testing and, and any downstream decisions that may come from that. So this is the idea that we are not trying to tell them what to do based on the information. We are trying to present the information to them, weigh the pros and cons, benefits, limitations, and then allow them to make that decision. And again, maybe use some of those um, psychosocial or counseling skills to help facilitate that decision making, but without, um, without providing instruction. And the theme of that discussion is something called non-directive counseling. So again, that's just counseling that refrains from providing direction or advice. Um, it's more to help the patient themselves clarify what it is that they truly want to do rather than just looking to us to say, here's what you need to do. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Obviously, there are um, occasions where a genetic test result provides specific um, recommendations that would, would drastically reduce the chance of an illness or um, present an avoidance of harm that is, that's pretty clear cut. And of course our, our um, discussions are a little bit different in that sense, but there are a number of areas in genetics specifically and in kind of genetic healthcare where the decision really is up to the patient on how they would like to proceed based on their own values, their own situation um, and what information they're comfortable um, seeking and what information they would rather not um, specifically seek out at a given time. Um, another uh, sort of concept or, or um, piece of information that I want to put in your hands is um, a little bit of background on the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So if you're not familiar with this, sometimes it's, it's referred to as GINA. This was actually passed um, a number of years ago. It actually uh, came about before the Affordable Care Act. So it was something that was kind of specific to genetic information to allow um, individuals to not uh, receive discrimination based on pieces of genetic information in the areas of employment and health insurance. So basically it kind of acted like um, protections against pre-existing conditions back before that was um, a common thing that we're now familiar with because of affordable care but it was all specific to genetic information and they define genetic information as um, genetic test results, uh, going to see a genetic counselor. So like participating in a genetic consultation or a geneticist, which is a, a physician that specializes in genetics, um, participation in genetic research. And then another thing that people, um, I think sometimes forget about when they're talking about Gina, cause they're thinking, well, I've never been to see a genetic counselor. I've not been in a study. I've never had genetic testing. So I don't have any genetic information that I need to worry about for the purposes of this act. Um, but family history is actually included in that. So if any of you have ever been to a primary care physician and reported a family history of cancer or diabetes or heart disease, that is genetic information that is specific to you and um, would kind of apply under the provisions here. So that can't be used for uh, you to be discriminated against for employment. Um, your health insurer cannot raise your rates, drop your coverage, or um, otherwise cause you um, problems based on that genetic information. But there are some important limitations. Some of these include um, the employment protections not applying in the, in the context of small businesses. And it also does not uh, cover um, life, long-term care, or disability insurances. So those supplemental insurances that people may want to seek out. So we're always really careful to sort of talk about um, this information, you know, in, in general, but also 
specifically before someone is undergoing a genetic test because it could, um, it could influence how they want to proceed. And there's a couple of other terms that I'm gonna come back to um, after I've jumped more into our case example. And it's gonna be privacy concerns and duty to warn. So just be on the lookout for that. All right, so I'll tell you a little bit about um, Hudson Alpha. You know, Hudson Alpha is um, a lot happens here in Huntsville. Um, it's the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology. It was founded in 2008, um, really as a place where research, economic development, education and now genomic medicine could all exist under one roof. I could spend a whole hour kind of going through all sorts of areas that we do research in, our education programming, um, the relationships that we have with um, other, uh, so we're a nonprofit organization, but we have a number of uh, for-profit companies that have space on our campus to kind of lead to this biotech um, ecosystem, if you will where researchers and entrepreneurs are working side by side on a regular basis. So lots is happening um, and I can, you know, if anybody wants more information or wants me to, um, to lead them to more specific overviews of the different areas of research, I would be happy to do that. But I'll talk a little bit specifically today about some of the genetic counseling activities that we um, come up against and specifically in the context of one of our large scale um, NIH grant funded studies from a couple of years ago where we were looking at um, how genomics impact developmental delay. So um, sometimes we like to say that we are actually doing genomic counseling at Hudson Alpha because a number of our research and clinical projects actually revolve around using whole genome sequencing technologies as opposed to discrete genetic tests. Um, so just as a reminder, um, you guys probably know this because I know I've got a lot of scientists on the call, but um, our genome um, as being all of our genetic information compared to the kind of historic look at our genes or as a whole, our exome, which is only about one to 2% of that information. Um, and that's sort of where the switch started happening a few years ago in, in terms of this back and forth between genetic and genomic, whereas genetic was focusing on kind of how to discrete. So for the purposes of genetic counseling, for example, how to discrete changes in specific genes contribute to disease. But now that we have the ability to do whole genome sequencing on a regular basis, and it's becoming more and more cost-effective as time goes by, how can we take those, um, take that approach to really um, look at the genome as a whole to untangle some of these, um, some of these rare disease or common disease mysteries? One thing that um, Hudson Alpha does spend a lot of time doing um, both in the clinical and research space is diagnosing rare disease. It is by no means the only thing that we work on, but it's something that the genetic counselors are especially involved in. Um, and you'll kind of see why based on what you know now about genetic counseling and, and how it becomes important for communicating this information to families. So we know that um, about one to 2% of all children are born with some type of symptom that is suggestive of perhaps an underlying genetic condition. So that, um, that alone tells you, okay, there's a lot of people out there that can benefit from understanding a reason for, um, for their symptoms or for their disease. But keeping in mind too, that for many patients or families that have undiagnosed rare disease, they have been on a bit of a diagnostic odyssey. So usually this takes a number of years. It's quite expensive because of the number of specialists that have to be seen and the tests that need to be performed to try to figure out you know, what's going on and how can this person potentially be helped if we, can, if we can understand a reason for their symptoms. And by ending that diagnostic odyssey and providing them with a diagnosis, we can do a number of things. So um, especially in pediatric patients, you know, if you have children that have um, significant health or developmental challenges, there's often a lot of parental guilt and wondering, you know, is there something that they did or did not do either prenatally or in the, um, the child's early, um, early childhood that could have um, contributed to this. It can provide recurrence risk information. So just knowing for the family, you know, what is the chance that this could happen again and, and kind of provide that information for their own family planning, but as well, to rel as well as to relatives. And it could guide follow-up and or treatment. Although to be quite frank, that is, that is kind of rare um, in genetics. You know, oftentimes we're finding the diagnoses, but not necessarily pointing them toward a specific treatment but you never know until you try and we can't even get people in many cases eligible for 
potentially um, meaningful clinical trials and, and some of those, um, you know, some of that work that's going on without having a specific um, genetic diagnosis for them. So that it does open a lot of doors in many ways. So one um, particular study that I alluded to that um, involves developmental delay. So this was a, um, an HGRI grant um, that was awarded to Hudson Alpha a number of years ago where we were specifically using whole genome sequencing to try to understand um, causes of pediatric developmental delay and intellectual disability. So to orient you to this slide, um, for these purposes, primary findings were referred to as those findings that explained the child's symptoms. So this is how often we were able to find um, a uh, result that said, yes, you know, we, have un we now understand the cause for this child's um, De developmental delay or intellectual disability. And secondary findings were how often we were finding, and admittedly it was a, a rare list of things that we were looking at, but how often we were finding really straightforward risk factors for additional disease risk, um, either for the child or for their parents, because whenever parents were available, we did um, want to enroll them because doing a trio whole genome sequencing is a little bit more robust. So um, pathogenic and likely pathogenic simply means um, how often we found causative or likely causative um, genetic variation related to disease. Um, obviously uninformative or sometimes referred to as negative. This just means that we did not find new information. It obviously does not rule out a genetic cause for a number of reasons, um, limitations of the test itself, limitations of our ability to, to interpret it. And then this sort of pesky variant of uncertain significance um, wedge on these where these are variants that are reported back to patients and families. Um, these are quite common across research and clinical genetic testing. So this wasn't just because it was a research study where we find variation that is of interest for some reason. We have some evidence suggesting that it could be connected to disease, but either there's also significant evidence suggesting that it's benign or there's just an absence of evidence kind of in, in both directions where we um, can't really make heads or tails of it. And so there, um, there has been a, some angst about reporting these in the past because they can be quite confusing. Um, in genetics, we're pretty comfortable talking about them, but our colleagues that are non-genetics professionals um, in healthcare that are receiving these types of results back on genetic tests, genetic tests that they may order, um, they, they sometimes are, are a little, um, a little angsty about it just because it does, um, it is a little bit confusing to counsel patients on these sometimes. Um, so all that to say, um, this is an example from this research study of a um, young man that enrolled with his family. He was 16 years old at the time. He presented with um, moderate intellectual disability, failure to thrive, pulmonary stenosis, which is a specific type of structural heart defect, short stature, Dysmorphic features, which is actually a pretty common symptom in genetics that just explains sort of an umbrella term for any physical feature that's a little bit different than you may expect um, based on family resemblance and that sort of thing. So sometimes it can be, um, usually we're thinking about it in terms of the face, but sometimes it can be, you know, features of the feet, hands, um, you know, other parts of the body that um, are not necessarily a health problem and are not like a functional difference but just a difference in appearance that is, that is notable um, and can provide clues. Hydrocephalus, which is um, kind of a collection of fluid um, on the brain. And what actually was very interesting for this particular young man is his note um, from his physicians noted an unusual hair texture. He had this um, very curly or wooly hair that was not really um, in line with his ethnicity and, and didn't really seem to um, kind of go with the, the hair texture and, and his other relatives and, and what you would expect for, um, for again, his age or ethnicity. So they made a note of it as, as sort of an interesting feature. Um, if you're not familiar with looking at pedigrees here, so the um, squares represent males, the circles represent females, the shaded individual with the arrow is our patient. So we um, collected a, a family history on them. Um, again, we were able to enroll both parents into the study to receive whole genome sequencing as well. And he did have a younger brother who did not have any of these symptoms. And there was no family history of intellectual disability, developmental delay, or any of these other um, symptoms either. 
So for this young man, um, we actually found a de novo shock two variant on chromosome 10. So I'll kind of break all of that down. De novo simply means that it was brand new in him. It was not shared by his parents. So if you remember earlier in the talk, I mentioned the idea of having um, inherited genetic variation versus um, genetic variation that's specific to a person. So this is an example of that. This is a genetic condition or genetic variant that um, was not an inherited condition or variant. Um, shock two was the gene name. So I'll come back to that one. And then of course, chromosome 10 was just telling us which chromosome it was located on. Shock two um, pathogenic variants or disease causing variants in this gene have been associated with a condition called Noonan-like syndrome with loose antigen hair. So we've got something called Noonan syndrome um, with an unusual hair texture. So the hair texture thing sounds familiar, but what is Noonan syndrome? So Noonan syndrome is um, an autosomal dominant condition that's associated with heart defects, short stature, developmental delay and characteristic facial features. And so looking at this, this actually described our patient quite well. And, and based on the evidence that was available about this variant at the time, it also backed up that it would be, um, it would be a pathogenic variant and, and likely the cause for his condition. Um, one thing that's interesting, so this was um, a few years back, but this patient had been previously tested for what were known at the time as common Noonan syndrome genes and, had, and testing was negative because this shock two gene had just recently been published and had not made it on to the panels for routine Noonan syndrome testing. So that kind of gives you an idea of how beneficial whole genome sequencing can be because you're not having to pick and choose which genes might be related. You're going ahead and getting all that information and having it available um, for um, you know, an up-to-date look back at the literature or, or whatever databases that the laboratory may choose to use to make heads or tails of this variation. So that's a lot of information to cover, right? And a genetic counselor is responsible and, and was in this case, one of us um, here at Hudson Alpha was responsible for going over all of this information with the family. One note, um, autosomal dominant. So y'all may um, be familiar with the fact that that usually lends itself to a 50% recurrence risk. So for the child himself, his risk to have children in the future would be 50% um, for them for each pregnancy to share this variant. But for his parents, because this was a brand new variant, the chance for them to have another child with this condition would be very low. We can't say zero because we couldn't rule out the possibility of something called germline mosaicism, where um, other egg or sperm cells may have the same variant. But for his brother, you know, his aunts, uncles, cousins, the chance for them to have a child with this condition would be the same as any of us on this call right now, just the chance for um, this brand new uh, variant to appear in the next generation, which of course would be low. But that's not all we talked about. So I uh, apologize, that slide kind of um, formatted a little bit weird, but this is just an extended version of that same pedigree that, um, that we showed earlier. We actually found a variant in um, his father that's associated with an increased risk for certain types of cancers. It's a condition called Lynch syndrome. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide as far as what those risks look like. But his risk for cancer is so much higher um, than the average person that he now needs to begin colonoscopies every one to two years and share his information with other at-risk relatives. And so this was a father that was in his 40s at the time. Most people don't start colonoscopies until they're in their 50s and usually they're only returning every five to 10 years to perform that procedure. So this is a, this is a major change to how his medical management would be handled. Um, this is an autosomal dominant variant. It usually is inherited through family. Sometimes it can be brand new. Um, in a person, but usually it, it is inherited. And the son in the study did not inherit this, but we do know that that younger brother is at a 50% risk. Um, and some of these other relatives likely are as well, but he reported no history of, of related cancers. And so when looking back at the family history, we noticed that he had a father that died at a younger age in a car accident. So things like that in a family history can sometimes mask um, genetic conditions and um, for something like this where you have an inherited cancer predisposition, if the cancer is typically not um, happening until a person is well into adulthood, people that pass away at early ages, um, again, can have the variant but have never developed um, the, the symptoms before they pass away. And a lot of these conditions are also not 100% penetrant, meaning that not everyone in the family that has this variant would be expected to develop the associated disease. Um, there's also kind of going back to that psychosocial piece of things, there are also possibilities of um, things like estrangement 
obviously adoption. Um, there are all kinds of reasons that people don't have a good handle on their family history information. And some people are just not good at communicating family history information. They don't have a lot of health literacy. It's not, they may not regularly go to see physicians and may not really know their own health status to be able to communicate it to other people. Um, so all of these issues do come up when you're taking that family history. Sometimes it's not as simple as just saying, you know, list all of your relatives and what their health conditions are. You're really having to do a little bit of investigative work to, um, to understand what's going on. So these are kind of um, just as a visual representation of the cancer risk. So these blue bars represent the general population risk for each of these cancers over the lifetime. The green bars represent what the uh, risk would be for someone with this variant that dad shared. Um, so just to kind of, um, as a reminder, all of this information was discussed at the same appointment and at the same result session. So you can imagine it's a little bit of, of results um, or information overload for some of these families and that good uh, straightforward communication skills are very important. Okay, so I told you we were gonna come back to this, this privacy and duty to warn. So now we're gonna kind of put our bioethicist hats on for a moment. When thinking about um, HIPAA, so you probably are familiar with that as a term, um, it is a, an act that was passed uh, several years ago that requires protection and confidential handling of protected health information as one of its provisions. So the duty to warn is this idea that an individual, usually it's kind of used in the healthcare provider context, has an obligation to warn another of a threat or a situation that can cause harm. Okay, so a couple more definitions and I promise I'm finished with those for this talk. So what is the harm? These are just things for you to think about. We can discuss it more um, as soon as I'm, I'm, I wrap up here. What is the harm, if any, that could occur if the dad in this family chose not to share this result with other family members? So if you think about that increased cancer risk, you know, him not, you know, oh, he doesn't talk to those relatives. He doesn't, he doesn't want them to know his business. He doesn't want them to know he's in this study or whatever the case may be. Does the genetic counselor have a responsibility to notify his family members of this result? So is there a situation where in, try, in that duty to warn sense that I would be on the hook for getting in touch with these folks and letting them know that, that this is going on in their family? But what if I had another family member as a patient um, and maybe they were coming to see me for some unrelated um, unrelated concern, but they were trying to discuss what type of genetic testing approach would be best for them. And I know that they're at a very high risk to share this variant that's probably not on their radar based on that pedigree that we saw, um, you know, thinking about like how to handle that. Um, and again, these are just kind of to noodle on. And just as sort of a reminder, I'd be kind of talking about all these family members over here. Um, so kind of to close before I kind of get into the nuts and bolts on a couple of slides about genetic counseling as a career. Um, some of the challenges that we regularly are dealing with as we expand to this more genomics approach to, um, to care. How do you prepare patients for the amount of information that can come from this testing? So that big long discussion that we have with this family, how could I have possibly prepared them for that at the time they enrolled in the study or first came to see us? Um, going back to those variants of uncertain significance, is it appropriate to report those? Or what if we had those in multiple genes and I'm having to walk through all of these different variants of uncertain significance, weighing the evidence back and forth for the patient, but then summing up the whole discussion saying, but we don't actually really know if any of these are connected to your illness. Um, what if the testing is performed because of a pediatric problem? So if it's performed in a, in a child due to symptoms, maybe you know we're not involving the parents in testing at that point and returns a finding in something like this uh, Lynch syndrome that has an adult onset presentation. So it's not something that would affect the child um, while they are a minor. I mean, do we automatically report that? Is that something where we try to protect that patient autonomy and let the child decide for themselves if they would want that type of information once they're an adult? And this is a big one. Um, what happens if healthy people with no family history of genetic conditions want um, large scale genetic testing like whole genome sequencing just to see and just to kind of look under the hood at their genetics a little bit. What are the types of things? Well, number one, should that be allowed? But number two, what are the types of things that we should be talking to them about? And how does that, how's that communication different from the situation that I described earlier where you have a family member um, or a child that's coming in because of already having symptoms? Um, you know, do we talk about the testing and its benefits and limitations a little bit differently in a so-called healthy population? 
All right. So um, for these last couple of slides, I'll just uh, mention that to become a genetic counselor, it is a master of science program from an accredited genetic counseling training program. So um, there's a number in the Southeast. Um, I went to the one here in Alabama at UAB. There's only, there's only one in the state, but there's about, um, it has grown in recent years. I think there's about 42 or 43 nationwide at this point. Then you successfully complete a board exam upon graduation and um, then apply for a license if the state that you are practicing in requires licensure. Most states now do, um, but there are a few exceptions. One thing that I like to highlight with, um, especially undergraduate students or high school students that might be considering this, is that there's not a particular undergrad major. Obviously, most of you on this call probably are in the sciences. Um, but any major that allows you to um, fit in the prerequisites of genetics, biochem, statistics, and a couple of psychology courses will, will make you eligible for applying to genetic counseling school. They're not necessarily looking for like a genetics major or a molecular biology major. Um, you would consider shadowing a genetic counselor. So actually coming into a clinical setting and, and working alongside a genetic counselor for a couple of days and sort of seeing what that um, looks like in practice. Volunteer experience is key. So crisis um, counseling, uh, working with individuals with disability, working with individuals that have complex healthcare needs. So for example, when I was an undergrad, I actually volunteered as some of my volunteer experience in a um, HIV AIDS clinic. So of course that's not a genetic disorder, but I really got a good sense of um, the multifaceted level of care that's required for individuals with kind of a combination of both medical needs, but also psychosocial and emotional needs. And then, um, of course, research opportunities are, are great as well. Um, anything that can get you exposed to um, different types of genetic technologies or um, any type of clinical experience, if you have the opportunity for any clinical research experience um, in your undergrad career, that can have um, great carryover for this as well. So I will stop there. I think we have a few minutes for questions. And please make note of my email address. I welcome contact from students. I get emails from students all the time. So you're not bugging me at all. Um, I love uh, you know, answering questions and, and I've done a number of one-on-one -on -one, um, discussions with uh, students that would like to learn more as well.